Yeah. It's me again. <laughs> okay. Um, so this time we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> irrigation with the rain water, which is sometimes called recycled water, and looking at the long-term effects on the soil. Are we talking about <clears throat> Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, a study that we did on a vineyard in a, um, is that Bosco? Yeah, in the Valley Valley. Um, um, there's a vineyard there that's uh, associated with the Yellow Fire Community College um, that's been irrigated with uh, senior recruited uh, recycled water for a good number of years, and we did a study to kind of see. Um, the effects of uh, long term irrigation with uh, recycled water on the cell and the vineyard. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to see this. Yeah. Um, some of these uh, concepts of cell health we talked about early in the morning, so we skip all of those, but that's still the same. Um, same principles of uh, <clears throat> promoting and maintaining and maximizing uh, cell health that we mentioned in the, in the morning, uh, maximizing uh, living roots and biodiversity and cell coverings and cover crops and minimizing disturbance if, uh, unless you have tools and principles we talked about in the morning. Um, <clears throat> cell health and water availability. Water is uh, a critical issue, especially in, in this part of the country. I've, I've come to learn aspects about water and water availability uh, in Arizona and the United States that's different from you know where I come from. Where I come from, I'd say, and I don't mean to brag, but we are you know, blessed with, with water. My country is where the river now flows through, and I've never heard of things like water rights and somebody or anybody. So that's a little bit so I'm learning. So um, and it's it's a very key aspect to agricultural production, life and livelihood in this part of the country. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's impossible to talk about agriculture and production as I'm talking about water in, uh, in Arizona in, in particular. <clears throat> so water availability is a, a key aspect to, you, know, you can't go stuff without water. And uh, <clears throat> water from the soil for, for agriculture is, um, comes from multiple sources. It's, it's underground water. It's water from glacier runoff, from mountains. It's irrigation. Uh, those are usually the primary sources of water. But those sources are, you know, getting limited and being used up and not being re replenished as, as a rate that is consistent enough to as as to be replenished as, as much as they're being used. So, what, so sometimes even in the soil, just because there's water, it may not be available to, um, to crops, and that's what this picture um, <coughs> is showing here. Um, <coughs> there's water that's available, there's water that's attached to the soil particles and it's not available to, um, um, to, the, to the crops and the plants, and then there's water that's available, and then sometimes when you have fuel capacity, you know, there's, and there's too much water. So <clears throat> talking about underground water sources, and in particular aquifers, aquifers which are um, a geological formation that is saturated with water that's permeable and uh, uh, <clears throat> available, um, um, uh, water that's available uh, from these underground springs. And um, there's two, <clears throat> There's some differences is um, underground water from aquifers that's <clears throat> not free flowing and there's water that's free flowing. So those are some of the differences. This is a map of the United States that's showing some of the major underground aquifers. And in yellow, we see <clears throat> uh, what we call a consolidated aquifer. There's water there, but it's not free flowing and available. And the majority is the blue kind, which is um, unconstrained um, <clears throat> water that's available that's free flowing. The biggest one um, right here in the middle, the Ogallala Aquifer, is, is pretty famous as one of the largest in, in the country, and uh, it traverses about <clears throat> eight states um, from the Midwest, a um, little bit into uh, Texas and Mexico, and this supports about <clears throat> 20 billion, uh, 20 billion worth of food production in a year. But if uh, 
more than 90% of the water is used to you know, irrigate crops and has been used up and it feeds. <clears throat> um, I had some thinking about how long it would take to replenish if it was used up. Six thousand. Oh yeah, six thousand yards if it if it was drained. But how long it would take for it to be a product? So this is a, a very big source of um, underground. I don't know about uh, <clears throat> uh, this part of the state where most of uh, water that you have access is it is it from uh, underground water? Is it from rivers? Is it what? What's the underground water? How do you put wells around here? Four hundred. Right, right here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, so. Yeah, that's uh, underground water, but it also gets used up. It's not an infinite source of water. And uh, so this map and the map that I'm going to show you next are kind of related. You see where the other over, over aquifer is and the others that I show. But this one shows. Um, <coughs> Um, how much uh, depletion has occurred. Um, well, this map shows just from uh, 1900 to 2008, it's a bit, it's a bit old. Um, if you want to guess, it's, it's gotten worse, it's not, it's not gotten better. Um, so we are using up this water from the underground, and I think this, this picture shows um, after 2008, uh, map of the whole uh, <coughs> United States uh, on, on the west side, and see with each subsequent year, um, the extent of water depletion is, is, is getting extreme. I think some, <clears throat> um, some people have, uh, would normally call it drought, but some people have said maybe we need to find a more uh, harder, harsher term so, so that you know, it strikes people and some people are kind of starting to refer to it as aridification and desertification of uh, um, these different environments that you know, normally have water sources. So, <clears throat> In Arizona, um, there is a, a resource on, uh, this is free and available on the Inverse website. It's called Arizona Know Your Water. That's where I get this figure from. That shows that uh, <clears throat> um, the, the water source of uh, the biggest water sources in Arizona, which is uh, um, the Instead River, accounts for about 16%, the Colorado River, about uh, 18%. The Central Arizona project, which was uh, uh, started, uh, I think, in the early 1900s, uh, here to bring water to the southern parts of, of Arizona, mostly for agriculture. And uh, by the time it was uh, uh, completed, there was more demand for you know, domestic use and industrialization. And some of that has gone to, uh, to those uh, purposes as opposed to agriculture still as a share. But that also uh, that accounts for about 24% <coughs> Agricultural in, in, in Arizona, and the biggest uh, percentage is underground water, which is uh, 39 percent. So, as this, <clears throat> um, with a reduction in water from the Colorado River, that it's been all over the years, and what you all that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, that is going to impact the amount of water that's available to the Arizona. <coughs> Uh, 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 Central Arizona project, and that's going to reduce agricultural allocation by approximately 50 percent by um, I guess this year. So much of the challenges that everybody, especially in, in the state of Arizona, is in Florida, um, what what alternatives do we have? And recycled water is you know it's, it's, it's one of those alternatives. It's water recycled water basically. <coughs> Uh, means you for the same drop of water that you may use in, you know, in your kitchen or in your, uh, in your home, you can repurpose it for other uses. Uh, <clears throat> now, most of the recycled water was uh, originally thought to be treated to, uh, to labels that are sufficient for drinking water, but um, the speed at which that was, uh, was <clears throat> the rate at which that was, uh, the, that water was being treated was not as fast, there was more water to treat to domestic uh, consumption and there was water left over, so there was a change in regulations and that allowed some of that water to be used for agricultural purposes. So recycled water can, again, it can be any skill that you can do in your home, you can make a system as small as a top picture over there and just have water left over that you can use, you know, um, on, on 
farm on a piece of land, or, or it can be something as, co as complex as this. The cities and, and, and towns that have systems that have been evolved and designed to be able to reuse, um, to reuse and recycle water for purposes that they deem fit, which include um, agricultural production depending on, on where they're. On where they're. Um, our state of Arizona is among the top states that are um, using uh, recycled water for agricultural uh, production. Yes. They do that for golf courses, but up here in the mountains, if you're going to do any of that, you have to go through the Department of Health and get a permit for the gray water that you're talking about. Uh, and they don't consider all sources within your home uh, as good places to get that gray water. Like they don't allow you to take gray water from the shower. Um, because of fecal contamination. I see. Um, so I'm not familiar with uh, laws and regulations as uh, concerning recycled water. I think the laws are going to change uh, from city to town, as uh, I said. But those are things that uh, you know you may need to check on to be able to you know make sure that you're not operating outside of what the recommendations by the authorities. But that's a thank you. That's a that's a good point that you raised. So <clears throat> let's spend a little bit of time and talk to you about this study that we did on a vineyard at Yellow Pie, uh, uh, Pie College in uh, in Clarkdale. <clears throat> that's where that is. They have a reclaim uh, a reclaimed the city recycled water line that they installed in their vineyard. And they've been using this tool for irrigating uh, the roads, the vine roads since 2014. So it was. Uh, uh, over, over these years, it, it's a good opportunity to study what effects um, that has had on the soil health and soil health indicators um, on this piece of land. Now, the vineyard uh, has, we divided it into three uh, three parts, depending on the soil properties. Basically, um, uh, clay composition is part of the field that is as high as clay, 60%, uh, 20%, and 10%. Clay. That's the only difference between um, the pieces of land where the vineyard operates. Um, the results from this study have been published, and this is basically an acknowledgement for the research group that we work with, including myself, uh, Dr. John Sad, Dr. Brown, uh, Michael Pierce at the Abu Pai College, and Dr. Isaac, who designed and uh, uh, most of the, of the study. Um, so this is what I was talking about, the difference between the fields. It's mostly uh, the difference in amount of clay, where one field is 60%, 30%, and 20%. And of that, uh, you know, the clay, uh, clay content has effects on, uh, on the drainage that uh, uh, one field is high, fair, good, and that part. But the biggest uh, difference between the, the fields is the clay concentration. Um, <clears throat> Again, we tested this water um, that they're using to, uh, to irrigate, just to see what is the composition, the mineral composition, to find that, uh, okay, as a guy, remember we talked about getting a soil test, if you see that stuff that you put into soil as an amendment, that could be, um, uh, you know, compost or, or whatever. So in this case, it was situ recycled water, and we tested it just to get that. Um, the mineral composition, and you see um, the sodium levels were high, and some uh, negatively charged ions were high. So that kind of gives you a picture of okay, this is going into the soil. How is that affected? Uh, so on top of uh, using these water lines for irrigation, they also use it to supply a urea for a for slides. So it's uh, a fertigation line for slides for irrigation and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and the fertilizer. So Herbert, you might. I mean, you might also think of it too, is even though you're not using reclaimed water, a lot of you could have water that's kind of those characteristics as well. So that's what you think about it in terms of the results here is there's a, a lot of high sodium water around. I don't know about in this area in particular, but particularly in southeastern Arizona and parts of central Arizona in particular, I mean, it's almost as like reclaimed water. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I think it's a, a, a practice that some producers do where they do they do water tests on whether it is a, um, 
stream of water or whatever they're getting their irrigation water to some people do regular tests to just kind of see what is in that water. Yes, sir. So, so most, most of the average water is, is tested anywhere between about 7.0 to about 7.5. 7.5. As far as acidity or alkaline? Oh, the pH. pH, pH yeah. 7.0 to 7.5. 7.5. Maybe in higher cases, some very different. Yeah, so that's about, um, that's about, you know, slightly acidic, slightly alkaline. 7 is neutral. And out, uh, this water came out at 7.6, which was uh, uh, a little bit towards the alkaline. Uh, End of the spectrum, so that is also something that uh, uh, so the, the water test showed us. And as <clears throat> again, this uh, we started to get into the results, and we see that. So what we did was uh, we sampled the soil in the rows, so that represented the part of the field that was irrigated with the reclaimed water, recycled water, and then we sampled the, um, the soil between the rows, so that's the part of the fields that was not. Um, irrigated. So that's what we are comparing rows and between rows. And we see that across the three fields, um, we can think about this generally, uh, these results were, you know, split out for the, you know, for the publication. But in general, we see that uh, the pH increased um, towards alkaline in, in all the fields as a result of um, this reclaimed water. Again, the water was high in pH. Um, we saw uh, an increase in that. Uh, <coughs> The uh, cation exchange capacity is uh, it talks about the uh, capacity of soil to um, regulate uh, salt and or cations and anions and all. I don't know how to simplify that, but uh, mineral composition when your soil has some we call it a buffer capacity where it can regulate some of levels of these things uh, innately. But <clears throat> and that's usually one of the indicators of uh, of a healthy soil that's affected, of course, it, it gets influenced by the things that you put into the soil. So that also changed. We saw an increase in uh, um, uh, nitrate, which is one of uh, uh, nitrogen minerals, uh, nutrients, uh, because of the water contained those, uh, uh, those minerals. So basically, it's what you put into the what you put into the soil is what you're going to get out. If you put in uh, stuff that's high in nutrients, uh, you're going to get nutrients. If you put in stuff that is uh, acidic, um, especially over a long period of time. So these are, um, we'll break this down a little bit. Again, we see um, effects on soil salts. Uh, one of the things that stood out with the reclaimed water was high in salts, especially sodium. Now, the sodium magnesium uh, balance is. Uh, are very critical to uh, soil salinity and soil salinity, uh, uh, so, excuse me, so sodicity, uh, which are indicators of uh, uh, salt levels in the soil. So <clears throat> again, the high concentration of salt in, in, in the water we're irrigating with this has been uh, since 2014, that's about how many years? Okay. Eight years. So we see that, you know, between uh, um, the rows and between the rows, we see uh, a higher level and concentration of, of, of the different salts across the clay, the clay levels in, in our field. Um, <clears throat> electrical conductivity, which is another indicator of, you know, uh, when you think about. Um, Electrical conductivity, it's kind of like how you think about electricity and wires and how uh, different ions and anions uh, conduct electricity. That's an, also uh, an aspect that is quantifiable in soil. Um, that was also, <clears throat> applied. and again, uh, I guess the generalization would be uh, the salt levels and salinity of, of the soil and how that is related to um, what we rate electrical conductivity to soil uh, uh, salinity and, and salt levels. So that also showed us that, yeah, the, the parts of the fuel that were irrigated with this reclaimed water had higher levels of salt and higher levels of uh, uh, salty aspects of, uh, <clears throat> compared to uh, between the rows where, where the irrigated water was not flowing. And this has been shown by, you know, we could see this in our study, in our results, but it's something that's been found 
where researchers have done similar studies and similar examinations of different fields where usually um, <clears throat> there's a higher buildup of salts in the soil when you irrigate with the plain water. Much as that may not be true for, again, it depends on what is the composition of the water that you're using to irrigate. Although it's, you know, consensus shows most times it's going to be high in salt than normal water. So that's something to think about. That may be true for this case and true for many cases, but it's not a rule of thumb that those salts are going to go up. It depends on the, whole, the composition of salt in the water that you're using to irrigate. And it's good. It may be reclaimed water, it may be water from another source. Um, <clears throat> again, mineral composition, um, this is you know, scientific results, but depending on the, on the mineral composition of the water area, gets in, in our case, there was an, <clears throat> there was an increase in nitrogen in, uh, uh, in the soil that was irrigated in the rows compared to between rows because uh, there was nitrate in the reclaimed water. Uh, we, may, we talked about the uh, uh, soil cation, uh, <clears throat> cation exchange capacity. And uh, the, high, the lower levels, sorry, I wanted to show that um, some of the uh, potassium in particular, again, this is going into specifics of the results and there's uh, some increase, some decrease. Uh, potassium in particular decreased within the, um, especially in the field that was low in, 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 in clay because uh, the low amount of clay allows uh, infiltration and or it's mostly called leaching, where um, this, um, <clears throat> when you're adding the high sodium, you uh, allows for the potassium to leave. So there's this balance of minerals that is also uh, being uh, comes into play depending on what you're putting into into the soil. So <clears throat> again, we talked about the complexities of soil health, and now there's very many intricate aspects that kind of tie together and also collecting. You know, and this is you're getting one thing in general, but there's very many things happening in there, and you're getting a balance that in, in, in the end is going to be good enough for what you're producing on the, on the land or not. So this is one of those uh, balances between different different minerals and uh, uh, and nutrients that we saw and, uh, as a result of uh, irrigation with uh, water. Again, we talked about uh, 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 microbial communities in the soil. As an aspect of, uh, <clears throat> of soil health. In this case, we found um, the irrigation with reclaimed water or recycled water kind of affected that negatively and reduced the, 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 the levels of uh, soil microbes, um, especially because of increasing uh, um, salt concentrations. Now, it's, it's some analysis, some studies have shown that you know when there's higher levels of salt. Uh, so this, these conditions will promote more, more, adapt, uh, more communities of microorganisms that may be adapted to salty uh, conditions in the soil. But what you need in your soil is, is, is a diversity. That, uh, we talked about uh, a diversity in the soil. So the more diversity of these microorganisms that you have, the better it's going to be in the soil. But if you have uh, conditions that are create uh, conditions in the soil that are promoting specific populations or specific communities, you lose out on some of these advantages that you'll be getting from having a diversity of, uh, of, of microorganisms in the soil. So this is kind of a secondary um, effect from irrigating with recycled water as higher salt and then affects another factor, another component of soil where it reduces um, uh, soil microbial activities. So um, in summary, just to wrap up, um, one, it's, a good, it's good to have an alternative source of, of water. Uh, production without water is uh, pretty much impossible in, in water. So the brown water and the other normal water sources that we have are being depleted. If we can get a viable alternative in recycled water, that helps in production. Um, <clears throat> again, we can see some advantages in, you know, Supplying of nutrients, especially nitrogen, that in many cases has to be added to the soil through manures or fertilizers. But if you can get that through, you know, uh, using recycled water, that's that's a plus. The, the disadvantages that we found, especially from this study that we did, was uh, the increase in soil pH, um, uh, the increase in, uh, in, in salts, uh, especially uh, uh, 
sodium and the sodium calcium balance, the leaching of potassium, and how that affects uh, the balance of other nutrients. Um, cell salinity and cell salinity, uh, we talked about salty cells not being good for siblings to germinate, for plant vigor, uh, for plant vigor and uh, energy uh, for plants, especially when they're germinating to be vigorous. And also, uh, but plants will die when, when they're growing in um, salty conditions. They will germinate, but they will not take off. And once you don't get to you know, harvesting, then you know, that is resources that are being wasted. Again, um, also the disadvantage of our use of microbial diversity also impacts uh, our cell health and, uh, and uh, our resilience of, of, of soil and the different advantages that we get from uh, drugs like microorganisms. Um, so, what are some of the remedies that have been <coughs> proposed that may remedy some of the disadvantages that come from the claimed water? Um, there's been proposals to focus on water recovery uh, instead of uh, nutrient supply. Um, <clears throat> sorry, here in, uh, uh, in this picture, I, I show a five action for farmers to hold uh, salinization, which is the soil to do that in soil. Um, wood quality water, if you start with wood quality water, that's usually good because it's what's in the water that's going to So if you start with um, water that you're irrigating with that's low in salt, you're not going to have as big problem, those, those type of problems. Um, organic matter, again, organic matter promotes, <coughs> uh, on top of having uh, soil nutrients, also promotes um, a healthy diversity of microorganisms, which would counter the, uh, <coughs> um, the disadvantages, that, the, the, the penalty that we took from um, having salt in uh, salt to do that in the soils. Um, salt tolerant plants, I guess that is a, a worst case scenario if you cannot remedy the, uh, the salt levels in the soil. Um, you can still be able to use your, uh, your piece of land if you grow salt uh, tolerant plants. And do you want to have examples of salt tolerant plants that may be adapted to this area? And if you can think of them as um, uh, salt bush grows out here and the sheep like to eat it and then they turn it into manure and meat. Salt bush? Salt bush. Salt bush. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not familiar with that. But it's a shrub that grows shrub. wild out here. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one example. So what's the scenario if you can't remedy that, you know, the, the, the salt do that in the soil, you can use it for something like that. Uh, uh, when, when you notice, again, this comes from uh, testing your water. If you notice uh, the salt is starting to build up in the water, it's, yeah, it's recommended to reduce uh, pumping and irrigation. Um, and then uh, use as much uh, mulching to decrease in evapotranspiration. Because once water evaporates from, from the soil, it, it's just leaving behind you know, the salts. So, yeah. Uh, high quality water to begin with, free from uh, uh, high concentrations of minerals and other substances is uh, one way to avoid salt buildup. And also, you can alternate the use of if there's a high salt concentration in the recycled water, you can alternate between um, recycled water and water from the underground. And that way, you kind of manage how much buildup is, in, is, in, is, is getting into your soil as opposed to. Continuing with the uh, recycled water and just continuing to add and add more salt into the soil, which is what we've seen that's happening at the screen yet. Um, <clears throat> cover cropping, mulching, and soil to This is kind of a summary from um, what's in the picture. So that's uh, kind of the results that we found uh, when we have been conducted this study uh, at the screen yet. And we are. Uh, um, Still doing more studies uh, on this on this, uh, on this farm, and uh, we, we are trying out some of the uh, some of the recommendations on it, comparing how that will try. Uh, you know, we are we're looking into uh, cover crops and mulching, and some of the treatments that we uh, 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 with us that we are testing at other farms. Just kind of see how that you know. 
um, some of the disadvantages or some of the uh, detriments that have occurred from using uh, recycled water on this, on this one. So again, uh, this is just an acknowledgement slide for the um, collaborators and the people that we are working with, especially uh, Southwest Wine Center at Yavuka College and uh, um, uh, the USDA that uh, provided the time for this kind of as well. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take them. Just some newer aspect of the soil uh, promotion. Oh, so that, uh, I apologize towards the end, we were running out of time and we kind of lost through both slides, but the work we're doing at Subutopia, we are doing both composted and sun-dried um, amendments, and some of the, um, the treatment conditions we have are our growth thermos in combination with phosphine, our growth thermos in combination with the uh, manure, and then fortune manure alone and phosphine manure so those are uh, part of the treatments that we are studying, and there will be a man, a man. Well, we'll see with the results that we get as we continue the project. Uh, we that's what I wanted to highlight when you asked that question. But yes, we are. So on on those when you're using the animal manures, do you have a higher level of salt? Um. So phosphorus can be a real high with the horse manure. We've seen that a lot of people. Yeah. <clears throat> They're just putting out the horse manure. What about cow manure? Uh, it's it's not quite as, but you can get. Okay, so I'm lasagna garden, right? So I trench six to eight inches deep. I line it with cardboard, black cinder sand, about four inches of composted cow manure. I fill up that trench with leaves and then I put the original soil right back on top. It is composting underground while I grow, but I grow year round, so I need that warmth in the wintertime. But my soil is so fabulous, but I'm concerned about the salt buildup, is why I was asking. Are you seeing the salt build up or just a part of, of, of your land while you're operating like that, or is it in general? Because if it is, then that would be, you know. I, I'm just talking about the one area because I grow inside a high tunnel that I got through the NRCS equipped grant program. Okay. So are you watering with drip? Or are yes. You yes. Are you with drip? Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I just, you know. You're, you're talking about salt buildups and stuff like that, and, and it makes me wonder if any of, if using the manures contribute to that, because when you eliminate, you eliminate salts and stuff out of your body, and if that goes into your compost, is that creating more of a, uh, a salt buildup when you use that in your garden area? Yeah, more than likely, yeah. And drip is also building up too because. Well, the I, I water, get that because I can see at the little yeah. emitters, it, it gets like white and a little crusty. And, it, and it's not just the emitters, but everything that pushes out from your drip tape is high salt there. So if there's no way for that to leach down, uh, you know, that's going to come back in. I mean, like in central Arizona, one of the biggest problems the melon growers had when they were growing on drip. Was when it rained because they had been pushing all the water out from the drip tubes. And then when it rained, they wanted to push it back in. It would be enough to, to kill their plants. So they would have their drip tubes on when it rained just to keep, try to keep the, the salts from coming into their plants. So, I mean, that's one of the things I think to think about on this study is just the reclaimed water has high salts. And that's kind of so anything you can do to manage. Uh, your drip tape and everything around that it is just critical, yeah, because the, the reclaimed water is what's going to happen basically when you're doing drip irrigation. Well, I had, the, having I had the plastic off the top of the tunnel over the summer, it just had the shade okay. straight across, and we had some horrendous rains where we had like one and a half inches. So, within you know short periods of time, 
So I'm hoping that that helped me flush yes, some that, of that. That may have helped, yeah. But it takes quite a bit to, to flush it down, too. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Lawton, are, are you familiar with Jeff Lawton? Uh, he's an Australian that goes and does greeting the desert in Jordan and other places. Yeah. And he has found that um, if you do what you recommended, which is keep living roots, and you keep uh, the cover crop or whatever going on, then the soil life will stay alive and it will actually wrap around salt and nullify its actions okay. over time. So if you are keeping a, well, I, your I soil life, it sounds like it's yeah. awesome and alive in there. And so actually the, the salts will become kind of like kernelized or nullified okay. so that they won't be active. I, I just was wondering how that interacted. Yeah, maybe just to repeat for our online audience that discussion broke out in the room where someone was concerned about salt yoga from uh, um, using new and composting uh, in that piece of wine. And uh, somebody gave uh, a very good example where, um, from experience, keeping um, living roots and little uh, uh, biodiversity and the diverse. Uh, um, population of roots on the ground kind of um, eliminated some of the concerns. So, so that's kind of uh, the discussion that's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have a question? I was going to ask. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. But that's one of the advantages of having a cover crop, though, too, is that you kind of break up that cycle to where you're, you're not just putting the nerve, the nerve, the nerve, and building oh, up the soil. It's only every seven years. Okay. So, uh, going back to the subject of reclaimed water, um, in my previous life, I was a landscape contractor and dealt with the purple pipe, you know, and reclaimed water. And I understand a, a lot of the logistics on behind that. I've also uh, interacted with people that are, uh, have done some of the studies and analysis. And I'm just wondering if your group has done any of the studies and analysis on some of the waters that are going through these pipes. And understanding that uh, a lot of a lot of the things that aren't studied in the, in the water um, analysis in these water plants would be like um, heavy metals, uh, apart from salts, and then also another big thing is pharmaceuticals. You know that gets mixed in the, uh, the system and doesn't they don't have the proper filter filters yet to be able to remove those types of debris where you're having a strictly organic type of water. Uh, uh, delivery system. Yeah, I think um, with heavy metals and pharmaceuticals and all that, those are very legitimate concerns with water that you irrigate, whether it's from rain water or water from uh, uh, underground and natural um, I, I can not say for certain right now, but I believe um, Dr. Isaac Mutanda has a uh, um, a study that is concluded is kind of he tested uh, water over at uh, <coughs> um, forget the name of the farm um, over at uh, the fish farmers yeah in yeah. yeah that's his body right um, it's uh, it's very uh, I think it's around the body of Yeah, it is in the very Yeah, I think in that study, I think it's probably then a more conclusive water case instead of as opposed to just looking in particular what is important with the crop production that we have here. So I do not have access to those results yet. So I, I would have one, but those are very legitimate concerns, especially about um, heavy metals. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.